as far as you know, in terms of, you know, every nation, of course, has uh, eye care problems, um, but some nations have certain problems that are a little bit more severe uh, in terms of certain diseases or, or things that happen in eye care. So in Afghanistan, what are the major conditions that you would see in eye care, perhaps that might even be different from other countries? Uh, I have, I've worked with the Health Net TPO uh, in the RAP survey. The survey was to find out the main problems of the eye, eye blindness. And we find out the major problems in our people was uh, blindness due to refractive error, second rate due to cataract. The third rate of the blindness in Afghanistan was a glaucoma, which it is very severe in our people. They came from a very far distance. So when they go back to, the, to their home, so we couldn't heard back from them and to follow up the glaucoma stages. I remember you wearing the World Glaucoma Week uh, t-shirt recently. So I guess that was part of the reason to raise awareness in that regard. Exactly. Every time I'm, I like to uh, show and I like to broadcast the, um, the glaucoma events, events for all of my colleagues. I was the representative of Afghanistan Society of Ophthalmology when I was in Afghanistan on 2016 up to 2019, which uh, I was the international relations director, which I had the contact with all ophthalmologists of the world. And I get the invitation for our ophthalmologists to go overseas and to participate in the ophthalmology congresses. Shabir, forgive me, but you seem quite young to be a, a main representative of uh, the international, um, or, or I should say the, the Society of Ophthalmology in Afghanistan. And that makes me think though, that this must be a society that already, um, you know, that, that it, it, maybe it wasn't so developed. Maybe it was young people like you even that had an interest and enthusiasm for ophthalmology that was needed for the country, which unfortunately now obviously is unraveling as we speak. Um, could you comment about that at all? So of course we have our own seniors, but we have an election every year. We uh, candidate ourselves in some post, which the, our society uh, broadcast to all the members. We had uh, the six board members, which all of them was young, even our president. Shabir, going back to what you said before about the eye camps that would happen in Afghanistan, I wonder if, uh, you know, whether those eye camps ever got into some situations that were a bit hostile, given the situation, as you said, the surrounding areas, not in Kabul itself at that time, but in the outside surrounding areas. Some of my colleagues work in ICAMS currently with the Ministry of Public Health. They usually went to the provinces, which it's under the control of a government, not under control of the Taliban. And you know, uh, one of the provinces which was controlled by the Taliban and the other provinces on the back of that province, which it was under control of governments. So our ophthalmology ICAMS, they went by airplane and to the other province. And is that likely because um, a delegation that would be sent to the province would be considered somehow to be a government delegation and so there would be hostility for that reason? Or is there, was there just a general hostility by the Taliban toward medicine itself? Uh, no, um, Taliban don't have any personal problems with the medications, but they have problems with the people who they who they help and who they work with the government. We know from, from its own name, it was ICANN. So it was funded and helped by the foreign organization like non-governmental uh, organizations, which was supported by, most of them was supported by United States. So that is why the Taliban already know and they have their own reports about them doctors which they came from the public ministry to the other provinces, those doctors are work with the, for the governments and the governments get the fund from the foreign people. You know, Shabir, I'm today sitting in Da Nang, Vietnam, which um, in the 1970s, there would have been a major evacuation here um, with, you know, supporters of the American government then fearing for their lives as uh, the North Vietnamese army poured into the city uh, to take it over. Uh, there was a lot of fear back then. 
Um, and I just wonder, you know, I, I'm trying to just look at silver linings or possible silver linings. But it seems that if the Taliban is advancing on Kabul and if there is um, some kind of transition which, in which they take over, let's say at least semi-peacefully, is it possible that, that, that maybe um, medicine will somehow continue in a way that at least, you know, in a way that perhaps we don't know yet, maybe there could still be some um, ophthalmic care that goes on in the future uh, despite the Taliban takeover? Is it possible? The eye care in Afghanistan, without supporting of the society members, without supporting of the ophthalmology internationally, we cannot conduct any service for our people. We need uh, medicine, we need a new method of surgery, and we need to be updated. You cannot contact the other people to help you uh, for uh, regarding of operation of the people without the contacting with the other society members uh, to start uh, progressing and to start and keeping your jobs as an ophthalmologist in Afghanistan and that can't do a lot to Taliban. And I think you would be the person to know because again, you were the representative of the national body of ophthalmologists there. So you would know, you would be in the position to know what would support that group the best. And it sounds like, um, you know, there just may be ties that are cut internationally for some time to come. It is impossible to not have any connection with the other countries and which I was the main part of the society members to contact with the, all the countries. And I get all their, all their, um, I mean, promises. All of the, uh, the society members which I went there, they already promised me that we will help Afghanistan. We will help your ophthalmologists, anything you want. For example, cornea donors, if you want some new technology machines or any new te a method of the surgery, we can contact for you like observership or in clinical exposure. Uh, right now, I think it is very hard to, to be updated in Afghanistan and to keep contact with the other countries. And, uh, and Shabir, as far as your visa goes in Australia, um, I mean, uh, how long can you remain there at the moment? Um, actually, uh, my visa condition in Australia is like I am in bridging visa. Your current status is not clear. I didn't get my permanent residency yet. Last year in 2019, when I went for my first interview, I know it is not allowed to share the story, but, but I just generally say that the case officer, he just talked with me like he, he, he is not believing on me. Uh, he, he really talked very tough with me and he talked like an unbelievable person with me. I really lost my courage. I really, I really lost my hope. And I shared all my story with him. After all, he said that, I'm so sorry, I cannot think that you are in a serious problem. Even I told them that, are you able to lose your profession? Are you able to leave everything here in Australia and go to any other country and start from the zero, even you, you, you leave your family, leave your, your, your children. So right now, my condition is not clear. And when my condition is not clear, I cannot apply for my family. Every day, I'm just searching and finding a way to go from Australia to another country. If you do not accept me here in Australia, so let me go to another country. But, but I cannot stay here without any reason, without any problems or without even I can't share this story with my, with my wife. If she hear about my problems, definitely she didn't accept and she can't bear that I'm in such problems to face with problems just for make a secure place for them. And every day I share that, I told her that I'm fine, man. I'm okay, please have a hope. Everything will be good, I'm okay. But with my daughter, I cannot, I cannot talk with with her about, you know, my daughter is three years old, but she don't know about anything. She always said that, please, my, my father, my da daddy, please take my hand and pull me over you, yourself. And I wanted to come to you, to your room. Or you have to come back from the, from the phone. Or why the other of my friends have their own, own father? Why I don't have my father? Why my father is in my in mobile phone? That's, that's really 
uh, but it's really hard for me to to hear. Yeah, in the Australian still didn't pay attention for my situation, and I'm like, like I'm like hopeless. I'm just waiting for unknown time for unknown reason. So right now, um, currently in Australia, there's lockdown. You know, there there's lockdown. And every people are staying at home. Every jobs are shutting down. No one can work in outside, but I'm working and working in frontline healthcare in the COVID. You, you've also done COVID screening there, you said? Yes. So now I'm working mm-hmm. in hospital in help the, the public health ministry to, to do their COVID tests and to do their vaccination jobs. And because, you know, I don't care about my, about my health. I don't care about my life. I'm just uh, helping the people to... Uh, because, you know, I'm a medical doctor and I'm an ophthalmologist. I really care about the people's life. And I'm doing the administration work like I'm just entering the data of the patients in the computer and I'm preparing mm-hmm. the paperwork. Another staff which they are doing the swabbing and they are checking the patient. All of us are working today, together in our one office. And, and how about your finances, Shabir? Uh, are you able to support yourself well enough in in Australia currently? Uh, Right now, currently, I am good with my finance and supporting myself and Mm -hmm. also supporting my family and back home. But, uh, but, you know, as the people who came uh, to Australia, the government is not supporting them. And the the government Mm -hmm. gave them the right to work, but they are not supporting the, the refugees and asylum seekers. Uh, the government has said, until you became a permanent resident, uh, we will support mm. you. If you are a refugee yeah. and if you are a asylum seeker, we cannot support you. It sounds like you've been yeah. um, maybe sending money home via wire transfers in that, that method. Um, do you think you'll still be able to do that? You know, sending money home? Um, Most of mm-hmm. people, they went to the bank and they, they wanted to get out their money from the bank in Afghanistan, Kabul. But the banks are not the, the banks are not working and everyone was escaped and everything was closed and everything was empty. So mm. the people always screaming and say that why our, where is our money and how we can get our money from the bank. So right now I'm very concerning and worrying about how can I send money for my wife to stay over there? How can I support them? It is very hard. Let's see what will happen next. And I don't know how can I support them. Well, I really appreciate you sharing your story today. And, um, you know, I've been in this profession, um, you know, coming up on 20 years as a journalist in eye care. And I I can say that, uh, you know, this is one of the most touching interviews I've ever done. You know, you know, so so, you know, I just want you to know that despite the circumstances, you know, your message resonates to me and I believe to the rest of the world. So thank you for sharing it today. Thank you so much, Matt Young. At least you heard my voice. At least you shared my my experience, which I had in Australia and how I might fall away from my family. So um, one thing which I have a clear message for all the, not even for the ophthalmology family, for all the world, please don't, uh, keep away a family from each other, a daughter from her father, the father from his daughter, or a wife from his husband, or her husband. So it is very hard to bear because every fam- every family need to be together, to be safe, to be uh, united. So I hope that uh, my situation is getting clear and and I hope everything gonna gonna going to be better in future but I don't know when and how. Uh, yeah, and thanks a lot for your programs that you invite me here. Well, Shabir, I believe in the power of the universe. And I think that somehow, some way, um, you know, things, at least for you, my friend, will, will make a turnabout. And uh, I'm wishing you and your family all the very best until that day comes. <laughs>